Hey everyone, Houston Math Prep here. We're going to talk to you about what's called an exact differential equation. Now this video is in our Ordinary Differential Equations video series, but we're actually going to talk a little bit about partial derivatives and how they can help us solve first order ordinary differential equations. If you haven't had a course in multivariable calculus, like a Calculus 3 course, that's okay. You'll still be able to follow along with what we do to solve these, but the first part might be a little bit foreign to you. So in calculus, multivariable calculus, if we had a function of x and y equal to zero, and we wanted to take the derivative of that function with respect to x, then we actually need to use the chain rule to do this derivative. And the first part of the chain rule, because f is a function of x and y, we actually get partial derivative of f with respect to x times dx dx plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times dy dx. Now obviously on the other side, on the right side, we would still get equal to zero taking the derivative with respect to x. If we simplify these partial derivative notations to our subscript notation, and I call these partial fx plus partial fy dy dx, one shortcut that we might have developed at this point for working with derivatives would be move the partial fx to the other side, and then go ahead and divide by partial fy, and we get a nice shortcut dy dx is equal to negative partial fx over partial fy. And this is actually a shortcut for implicit differentiation. So let's go ahead and set our implicit differentiation shortcut to the side. Let's look at another operation on this function here, our function of fxy, and that's actually del f, taking the gradient of this function f. The gradient of f is an operation that gives us information in terms of a vector field. It gives us the vector partial fx, comma partial fy, and that tells us information about rates of change on our surface, this function of x and y. When we think of this as a vector field, remember a vector field, we might think of some formula m comma some formula n, and that's just a formula for vectors anywhere in the plane. One thing you might have asked yourself about a vector field if you've done these before is wanting to know, is my vector field f a gradient of some function? In other words, we're asking, is m partial fx for some function, and is n partial fy for that same function? How would we know if that's true? Well, we think about mixed partial second derivatives. And remember the idea is these mixed partial second derivatives should be the same as long as the function is continuous and well-behaved and all that stuff on some region. Now partial fx, if I take the derivative with respect to y, gives me fxy. And partial fy, if I take the derivative with respect to x, gives me fyx. And those are supposed to be equal to one another. So what that says is if I take the partial derivative of m in my vector field with respect to y, and I take the partial derivative of n with respect to x in my vector field, if those are equal to one another, then I get that my vector field is a gradient field, and that tells me lots of other things that provide me shortcuts for all sorts of integrals that I can do with vector fields. This condition of the partial derivative of m with respect to y equaling the partial derivative of n with respect to x is also our test for exactness to determine if something is an exact first order differential equation. So if m is fx and n is fy, let's go ahead and plug that information into our implicit differentiation statement that we know is true. That would give us that dy dx is equal to negative m over n. And this begins to look like a differential equation that we might see. This can also be arranged a little more nicely to see what m and n are specifically so that they're not in the fraction with some sign changes here. We can rearrange this as m dx plus n dy is equal to zero. And the way we'll test to see if this is an exact equation here is just to check does the partial derivative of m with respect to y equal the partial derivative of n with respect to x. So if our equation is exact, in other words, it passes our test for exactness, what do we do to solve it? Well, remember that m is partial fx of some function, and n is partial fy for some function, then. That's what our test for exactness says. So what we need to do is just undo the processes that got us this m and n, and we can find dy dx. In other words, I need to undo the derivative with respect to x for this one, and undo the derivative with respect to y for this one, so I will integrate m with respect to x, and I will integrate n with respect to y. And if you did this in Calculus 3, this was about finding something we called the potential function. And it's really a similar idea in how we will solve our differential equations when they are exact first-order differential equations.
Remember, a short way to view the method of finding the potential function from calculus was to combine all of the unique terms that we get from both of these antiderivatives. That gave us the potential function, and here it will actually help us find the solution for our exact differential equation. We'll go ahead and work a couple of examples for you here. First, we'll test if they are exact, and if they are exact, we will solve them. And we'll check for exactness on the first couple using this form, and then we'll actually set them up as dy dx equals and do a couple of those. So here we've got x squared plus xy squared times dx plus x squared y minus y cubed dy is equal to zero. So this here is my m in this one, and this is my n, all right? You can see it's set up as m dx plus n dy equals zero. So I should just be able to check here. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's check. What is the partial derivative of m with respect to y? Now we treat x as a constant, remember, taking the derivative with respect to y. So this x squared term is really a constant, so we get zero from that. Taking the derivative of x, y squared, thinking of this x as just some constant multiple, the two will come out front and we'll actually get two x, y. If I look at the partial derivative with respect to x of n, I go ahead and take the derivative with respect to x of this here, treating y as the variable and x as the constant now. So if I treat x as the variable, this 2 comes out, we get 2x, we keep the constant multiple y, we get 2xy. The derivative with respect to x of y cubed, since it's with respect to x, y cubed would be a constant, so the derivative of this term is 0. And you can see here these are equal to one another, so we know partial my equals partial nx, and this is, in fact, an exact equation. So to find our solution, we'll go ahead and integrate m with respect to x, and we'll also integrate n with respect to y. We'll combine all of the unique terms that we get from both of these into our solution. So our integral m dx is going to be integral of x squared plus xy squared, dx. Now treating x as the variable here, we would get one-third x cubed plus, this is just a constant multiple, so we keep the constant multiple. Power goes up by one here, we'll get one-half. Power for x goes up by one, so we get x squared, y squared, plus some constant. And because we're integrating with respect to x and treating y as a constant, technically this constant could depend on y. What this is really saying here is that in the other piece of this, we might get some terms that only involve y. Let's do this other antiderivative here. So the integral of n dy is going to be the integral of x squared y minus y cubed dy. So if we integrate with respect to y, treating x as a constant, this is a constant multiple x squared here. Power goes up by 1 for the y, we divide by 2, so we get 1 half x squared y squared minus antiderivative of y cubed with respect to y would be 1 fourth y to the 4 plus some constant. Now technically our constant could depend on x and this is really saying that in your other statement you might have some terms that are only in terms of x and you can see that, right? And if you look at all of our unique terms, you can notice over here this c, maybe depending on y that we're talking about, is actually this term that only has y in it. And this c, maybe depending on x over here, is actually referring to this one-third x cubed that only has x in it over here. So if we combine all unique terms here and we set that equal to just some constant, then we'll go ahead and say our answer is one-third x cubed, so that takes care of that term, plus one-half x squared y squared. That takes care of both this term and this term. We don't write that term down twice. We only take unique terms. Minus one-fourth y to the four. So that takes care of that term now. Everything is taken care of except our constants. So we go ahead and say equal to c. And that is our solution for this exact equation. Let's do one last one. This one is exact. We'll go ahead and show you. So we have dy dx equals 3y e to the x minus 4x e to the y all over 2x squared e to the y minus 3 e to the x. So we'll go ahead and first get rid of denominators. So multiplying this to the other side and dx to the other side, we'll get 2x squared e to the y minus 3 e to the x dy is equal to our top here, 3y e to the x 
minus 4x e to the y times dx. Let's go ahead and move our dx term over to the other side. So getting that on the other side, it would change signs. So this negative term becomes positive. We'll say 4x e to the y. This will become negative. So minus 3y e to the x dx plus exactly what we have there. We didn't move our n dy at all. So 2x squared e to the y minus 3e to the x dy is equal to zero. So now let's check for exactness. You'll see that this works out. Partial my, this is our m here, derivative with respect to y of the first term would keep our e to the y and our constant multiple would stay. So this is 4x e to the y. Derivative with respect to y here, the negative 3e e to the x is all a constant multiple, so the y just drops off. We get minus 3e e to the x. Looking at n over here and finding partial nx, then the derivative of this first thing with respect to x, we would get a 2 coming out. We'd get 4x e to the y. And the derivative with respect to x there is pretty basic, minus 3e e to the x. You can see that these are equal. So since m y equals nx, then we get that this is exact. And remember what we do once we find that. We figure out the antiderivative of m with respect to x. We figure out the antiderivative of n with respect to y. We find all unique terms. We combine them into our solution equal to a constant. Okay, so this one first here, we'll take the antiderivative of, now go ahead and do it from this form, actually seeing what m is. That is 4x e to the y minus 3y e to the x dx. So let's go ahead and do that and give myself some room here. So if we're integrating dx, think about this, e to the y is just part of the constant. So the power goes up by one here, we divide by that power. So dividing by 2 will give us 2x squared e to the y. Now e to the x is the part that has variable x in it. This negative 3y is just a constant. So we go ahead and say we keep the negative 3y and the antiderivative of e to the x is still e to the x. So we get 2x squared e to the y minus 3y e to the x plus some constant that may also be a term with only y's in it. I'm going to go ahead and move my integral of n dy down here so I have a bit more room. So we'll say that's the antiderivative of, here's our n over here, 2x squared e to the y minus 3e to the x dy this time. So if we integrate this with respect to y, this is all a constant multiple. e to the y would stay itself, so we get 2x squared e to the y. And then integrating this with respect to y, all of that's just a constant. So if I integrate that with respect to y, I get that thing times y. So we get 3y e to the x plus some constant that may also involve terms only that have x in them. So we go ahead and look here at the unique terms that we have. I have a 2x squared e to the y here and here. So that's part of my answer, 2x squared e to the y. So that takes care of this and this. And you'll actually notice the only other term that we have that's unique is just the other term. And that one is also in both, right? So oftentimes you'll get some overlap. Sometimes you'll get complete overlap like we did here. So our solution actually here is both of these unique terms equal to C.